Okay. Uh, well, again, we'd like to, to thank the organizers for inviting me. A fantastic event. Um, a lot of diverse uh, talks. Um, really, really interested in what I would like to present today is some of the latest advancements in the field of liquid biopsies. Um, and I'll show some of the stuff that um, our laboratory here at Brunella University London um, has been has been doing, uh, has been working on. The liquid biopsies are not new. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's been years and years of developing various aspects of molecular biology, as well as uh, histo histochemistry. Um, moving back from, you know, last century when we first identified the um, CFDNA uh, in, in human blood circulating free DNA to actually these days now where we can actually uh, measure um, uh, different mutation loads and also interrogate liquid biopsies in a number of different ways. For those that are not initiated or they're not clear what liquid biopsies are, um, it, there are anything that is liquid, okay? So it can be primarily blood, but also can be cerebrospinal fluid, can be ascites fluid, can be saliva, urine, that they can be interrogated. There's a number of pros and cons when we compare the liquid biopsy to tissue biopsies. And actually, there's a lot of advantages to liquid biopsies. For example, when we take a tissue for uh, in, in, in the clinic uh, in order to, to perform uh, an immunohistochemistry, there could be tissue heterogeneity that can result in sample bias. One of the main challenges for tissue biopsies is that the, uh, you, they are invasive. You have to operate on the patient. You cannot take sequential readouts in order to see how the patient responds to. So it's really excellent way for, for as, as, as a prognostic um, avenue for serial monitoring of patients. And of course, it's non-invasive. Uh, what we're doing in, uh, in our laboratory is that we tend to interrogate liquid biopsies in a number of ways. So we are collaborating with a number of oncologists here in the UK. Uh, and what we do is we are a referral center where we take, let's say, 20 mils of blood, or less than that, actually. Uh, and one fraction um, gets collected uh, and RNA is extracted for transcriptomics, like RNA-seq, for example. Another part, um, we're collecting the, 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 uh, the, the serum uh, of, of the patients and, um, and we extract circulating free DNA. And of course, the main part of our um, uh, blood sample uh, gets uh, to be imaged where we're looking at circulating tumor cells. And indeed, there is a growing evidence that circulating tumor cells reflect features of cells within tumor masses. They do reflect what happens in the tumor microenvironment. And there has been an exponential rise in publications over the last five, 10 years to underpin the clinical utility of circulating tumor cells, not only as a diagnostic tool, but also as a tool for prognosis, but also monitoring response of patients in a number of different uh, tumors. Just to give you a brief overview um, when it comes to circulating tumor cells. Circulating tumor cells can be released from the tumor site, from the primary tumor site, as you can see here, and it can enter the bloodstream. They can enter the bloodstream as single cells or as clusters. Clusters mostly complex with some um, white blood cells. Latest data suggests that it's actually the other clusters that are far more, have a far more sort of carcinogenic potential rather than single cells. Anyhow, the cells do circulate in blood and they can reach distant sites to initiate key metastatic events. As I mentioned, there is a great variety to this. They can be clusters that they can transverse uh, through capillary sized vessels. They can go into, into the blood vessel in a single file 
and then come on, come out as a cluster. You also have um, these complexes with neutrophils. And again, the exact role of these neutrophil CTC clusters uh, is still under investigation. However, in breast cancer patients, it has been shown that when you have a presence of neutrophils along with circulating tumor cells, this correlates with worse prognosis. To make matters, I would like to say more interesting, but actually it can be a lot more complicated, is that we just don't have just circulating tumor cells in circulation, apart from the white blood cells, of course, you also have circulating endothelial cells. I mean, we know we have circulating endothelial cells that are associated with different uh, pathologies like cardiovascular disease, but in the context of cancer, there's also been some papers now start suggesting that circulating endothelial cells are appear to be increased in certain cancers, including ovarian cancer, uh, including um, renal uh, cancer and, 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 and breast cancer. So again, this is another neglected, in my opinion, area of research where we need really to dwell and start sort of identifying the circulating cells. I tend to, to call them cancer-associated circulating cells because, again, we don't know exactly what the nature of these cells are. The notion of cancer cells circulating uh, in... Um, in, in, in the bloodstream is not new. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was back in 1869 uh, when an Australian physician, his name was Thomas Ashworth, under a very, very primitive, very basic microscope, looked at these cells and he thought that, you know, he sees something different to the white blood cells. And actually what he wrote in this particular report was that cells identical with those of the cancer itself being seen in the blood. So it really, really goes back to those days. Of course, now with the explosion of the different techniques and different platforms and different tools we have at our disposal, we can interrogate and we can detect, we can enumerate, we can characterize circulating cells um, a, lot, a lot easier and, and more proficiently, of course. So there's different platforms to date that actually can be used to isolate and characterize circulating tumor cells, as I mentioned. They're based on gradient, they're based on the size of circulation tumor cells, They may, and, and also you can separate them with a number of different microfluidic and immunomagnetic devices. What we are using in our laboratory um, is a system called ImageStream. Um, in other words, it's a high-definition imaging flow cytometry. So it works like a fax machine, but what it does is enables you to detect every single cell that goes through stain with different antibodies. Okay, so you have a pretty good visual of what the cell looks like. So that's what the cells look like when we take them through the image stream. And here is a study where we use the non-small cell lung cancer patients. And what we see is in one channel, we see a bright field of the cell. Next channel, we see the stain with the cytokeratin marker. This one is a channel that we stain with CD45 to exclude white blood cells. This is the channel with drug 5 that is a nuclear marker, uh, stains the, the nucleus. And of course, this is where the picture is merged. And this is a quite interesting uh, image. Here you can see a single um, CDC on the top. On panel B, you see a white blood cell that is negative. And here you've got two cells. One is a white blood cell stained for CD45, and the other one is a circulating tumor cell stained with cytokeratin. And what we have shown is that uh, patients with um, lung cancer patients have a lot higher levels of CDCs, of course, uh, when compared to controls, admittedly, there is a huge interpatient variation. But this corroborates previous studies that actually have shown uh, that uh, uh, there is a prevalence of CTCs in the blood of lung cancer patients that correlates really nicely with disease severity. So there's been a number of studies now 
to suggest, like they've done with breast cancer, uh, that there is a clinical utility as a prognostic biomarker, the measurement of CDCs in blood of lung cancer patients. But it doesn't stop there. We can use the same platform to look at different levels and different malignancies. For example, this is in, in collaboration with Mount Vernon Cancer Center, where we looked at um, uh, circulating cells in anal cancer patients. Again, in a similar way, we had patients undergoing CRT. We measured the pancytokeratin. These are CD45 negative. And what we have showed is that as the uh, chemo radiation um, treatment uh, started, the levels of CTCs have fallen. And again, this could be used uh, to monitor uh, the, uh, the course of disease. Of course, an area that is particularly of interest to us, uh, and not just to us, is that of looking at prognostic biomarkers in ovarian cancer. The fifth most common um, uh, cancer uh, really lethal uh, because uh, of the uh, asymptomatic or the vague symptoms uh, it presents, and also the inability of CA125 to, to detect all uh, cancers. So we have embarked on this clinical study uh, called Cicatrix in collaboration with Mount Vernon Cancer Center and a number of other uh, hospitals um, to actually uh, look at patients uh, undergoing treatment and taking their bloods over the course of action until they relapse. And what we have shown is actually when we compare the levels of circulating tumor cells to the levels of CA125, um, sometimes they correlate nicely like this particular patient. But some other times when you have 10 to 20% of ovarian cancer patients that are non-responders, and they have a flat line of, of CA125, here you can see that measuring circulating tumor cells can actually be a pretty good tool to, uh, to look at the uh, response of the patient. Here you can see the arrows uh, are where each treatment uh, was, was taking uh, place. Some of the times um, it can be even uh, uh, far more interesting and more sensitive. So for example, here you can see a nice correlation between CA125 levels and, 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 and the drop we see uh, in circulating tumor cells. However, this patient here had a two month delay in surgery. And you can see although the levels are like on a flat line here of the CA125, this delay was picked up as an elevation of circulating tumor cells in this particular patient. Apart from interrogating circulating uh, tumor cells, uh, also, uh, we can look at uh, the clinical utility of circulating free DNA and circulating tumor DNA. So circulating free DNA is the total DNA that is released uh, from, from, from cells, and out of which, in cancer patients, the largest fraction is the circulating tumor DNA. There are challenges, admittedly, because, again, circulating tumor DNA really varies per patient, so it can be a small fraction up to 90%. The good news is that um, this clinical utility um, has been really appreciated. Um, there's been hundreds of studies now out there. And this actually has led to the FDA uh, approving um, last year uh, a number of various blood tests uh, from a number of different companies to actually being used as a diagnostic tool uh, looking primarily at um, EGFR mutations for non-small cell lung cancer, as well as following BRCA1 and BRCA2 alterations in prostate cancer. So we can now start seeing how we can move from tissue biopsies when we are looking at mutational load to actually liquid biopsies and following patients to see whether they can have an acquired mutation and where this can lead to, to, to a relapse. When in the small cohort of patients, uh, we measured circulating tumor DNA levels uh, as, uh, as a, uh, by measuring um, allo repeats. Again, we've seen that in this particular patients, 
there's been a tremendous increase uh, or a when we compare early to late metastatic patients and compared to controls, again, suggestive A of a prognostic potential. In collaboration with chronics, what we have showed, and I hope that will convince you, that the copy number stability events that are taking care, they're taking, taking place in the actual tumor, are also are reflected in that of plasma. So here we have in panel A, a patient that we have taken a tumor. Uh, we extract the CFDNA from, from, from a tumor and a plasma, and we compare it to the normal tissue. Each one of those numbers, of course, corresponds to a chromosome, and the red dots correspond to a chromosomal number, a copy number stability. And what you can see here is that the copy number stability at the tumor level corresponds really nicely with a copy number stability in plasma. On the other hand, you can see the normal patient here does not have um, any, uh, any copy number stability. So again, really good utility to see when things start going wrong. Um, last but not least, uh, this is one of our uh, most recent studies. Um, apologies for not adding the, um, the reference. Uh, it's been published in BMJ, Open Respiratory Journal, um, a couple of months ago, where we followed um, non-small cell lung cancer patients preoperatively and postoperatively. And what we have shown, if you just concentrate on this particular uh, panel, is that postoperatively, the patients shed a lot more circulating free DNA into circulation. And this is also associated with an increase in interleukin-6 and interleukin-10. So this, again, are really nice tools uh, to follow, not just the prognostic aspect, but also to see what's happening postoperatively in the patient. At the molecular level, apart from doing the DNA sequencing, of course, um, we can also look at uh, whole transcriptome. It's really important uh, to go um, in a non-biased way and explore how transcriptomic changes uh, can be used as a diagnostic or prognostic tool. And what we have done here is we compared um, no small cell lung cancer patients, uh, their blood and their tissue and how it differs. And of course, as you would expect, you will have some, some unique results, some unique molecular uh, signatures in tissue and blood. But 21 were common genes that actually have been upregulated or downregulated in a similar fashion. So this 21 can be a good biomarker, out of which, as you can see, they've been involved when we did the function analysis in a number of, of key events, such as cell growth and maintenance and protein metabolism. Out of those 21 genes, one stood out for us. Because the same level of difference in expression appeared to be in, 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 in blood as it was in tissue. And this was the X inactive transcript, it was called ZIST. And we reported this a few years ago. And since then, there's been a, a real expansion in literature suggesting involvement of ZIST in the whole etiopathogenesis of non small cell lung cancer. This is a long, long coding RNA, again, underpinning the uh, potential therapeutic role even if we move away from um, from from biomarker development uh, of this particular um, of this particular sort of target and again when we silence this in a number of different uh, uh, lung cancer cell lines again we've seen the differential expression primarily of numerous transcription factors again playing key roles in the signal transduction, cell communication, and cell regulation. So to, 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 to summarize, I feel that we're still scratching the tip of the iceberg, despite the thousands of publications so far. It's only a handful of tests that have been FDA approved. To the best of my knowledge, there's only one a device that has also been approved for enumeration and characterization of circulating tumor cells. So there's a long way to go. But 
we know that there are numerous advantages of liquid biopsies. They are reliable. The non-invasive nature is great. You really don't have to operate on the patient. Less trauma and generally less risk to patients. The signature, uh, the molecular signatures are of great use. You can monitor therapeutic response and you can have a number of longitudinal samples, as I just mentioned. Again, there is certain data emerging to suggest that even the circulating tumor DNA can even reflect tumor heterogeneity better or at the same level than tissue biopsies. Of course, as I have mentioned, there's numerous challenges. One stemming from circulating tumor DNA. We might have too little of that diluted in your in the DNA we extract. It is very, very difficult to pick up. Again, the difficult difficulties in capturing efficiency, standardization. Not all laboratories are actually using the same type of antibodies. We really need to standardize that. If we use WT1, uh, for example, to stain in ovarian cancer patients, we may have to make sure that we use the same antibody, let's say, that the hospital is using. We have to stay beyond the same path. We really have um, really to standardize all this. We really need to understand if there is a sample bias and how representative a liquid biopsy can be in all genetic changes of a tumor. I think it's pretty good, but we might be missing some. And of course, the other question is, when do these CTCs are true tumor cells? Do they carry all the cancer characteristics? Do tumor cells, single cells, have the same uh, oncogenic capacity or uh, mutagenic, sorry, uh, same, same capacity to metastasize uh, than the cluster cells. Do the cluster cells do something else? All these things that need to be answered. So it's a great field to embark upon. Um, and currently, apart from the Cicatrix trial, um, we have embarked on two, another two clinical trials. Uh, one called Centurion uh, is a phase two a randomized uh, clinical trial where we will be looking at these readouts in patients uh, that are BRCA mutant uh, and treated with rocaparib. This is a PARP inhibitor in the presence of, of absence of checkpoint inhibitors. And also we'll be collecting samples from uh, another clinical study of uh, rare neoplasms of gynecological um, origin. If I have not convinced you of, of the value of, of liquid biopsies, then just take the opinion of the Wall Street Journal um, recently called the liquid biopsies, the stethoscope for the next 200 years. And of course, we're not going to be alive in for 200 years, but I think for the next decades, we can do some, some pretty awesome work in this, in this particular field, working collectively um, around the globe. So with that, um, I would like to um, really um, acknowledge uh, my, my group. Uh, every time I said we, um, I meant they. They've done all the great work. Uh, and, and, and my collaborators uh, and the generous funding um, I have received for various charities. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you once again for this great symposium, great conference. And i um, happy to take uh, questions from, um, from, from the attendees. Thank you very, very much once again.